Yo, 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 welcome to another episode of Outside the Box. It is the podcast that your mom listens to and that you should listen. Wait, that's that's not the intro. <laughs> uh, it's the podcast that you should listen to and it's too cool for your mom is what I meant to say. Uh, I'm Jacques Slade. I, um, I'm the, uh, the ringleader, the bad influence. I am the kid that your mom probably tells you not to hang out with when it comes to this podcast uh, because you're a good kid. And the kid that they want you to hang out with, the two people that they're like, why don't you hang out with them more? They're so smart. They're really educated. They're intelligent kids. Uh, that's Tiffany and Nick. So Nick, go ahead and tell them where they can find you. Uh, <laughs> you can find me at Nick Engvall on all platforms, N-I-C-K-E-N-G-V-A-L-L, and also at Sneaker History on all platforms. But really, like, as my uh, t-shirt will probably show when you actually see this video, Tiffany's the one that you want to look up to as a role model. I'm, I'm probably the devil on Jacques' shoulder getting him into trouble. So, Tiffany, let him who, know who you are. <laughs> I'm Tiffany Beers. I've worked in the footwear industry for over 13 years. And I used to work at Nike as an innovator. And I am the quiet nerd that you probably picked on and made fun of. So no one was hanging out with this girl. <laughs> See, and that's, that's the thing. See, the ones that, that are quiet and that you don't really hang out with, those are the ones that grow up and have all the money. And then you're like, hey, we were such a fool in high school. And you were like, no, you didn't even talk to me. Um, or they become innovators. Or they create the coolest shoe you've ever seen. I don't know. Just throwing it out there. Just things that could happen when you're the quiet kid. So don't be afraid if you're the quiet kid. Uh, this PSA was brought to you the more, the more you know. Um, so... Welcome back to the show, everyone. Uh, thank you guys for checking out the last episode. As always, we appreciate it. We appreciate the feedback. Uh, you guys have been really great on social, on Twitter and Instagram, sending us messages and things like that. You guys really help make this a full show. Like the, We record the show, yes, but the experience outside from hearing you guys talk to us and give us feedback really makes it a holistic experience. That's my uh, big word of the day, holistic. Uh, shout out to dictionary.com. All right, this show... <laughs> is brought to you by Light Switchers and um, of course as the sponsor they do have an ad and we'll give you guys that whole ad later because we want you to use the Light Switchers app but before we get there let's talk business and that business comes from Nike's Kaepernick ad uh, it actually spurred sales there was a lot of talk online and uh, there was a lot of divide over political lines because Nike sponsored or I would say backed up Kaepernick in a very social way. Uh, it had people cutting off the Nike swoosh off of their already bought socks. Uh, if you follow the uh, Outfit Creep uh, Instagram account, you'll see that they spotted someone who actually put tape over their Nike swoosh as a form of protest. And again, I'm not opposed to your protest. Protest as much as you want. However, it appears that there's a lot more support for Kaepernick's ad than um, there is for dissent to the Kaepernick ad. I, uh, I'm not afraid to say that I applaud Nike for what they did and, and showing support for the areas of social justice which Kaepernick is involved in. Um, and I, I think it's cool. And there's some, some stats, actually. So, Nick, I remember you were talking about some stats. Like, what's what's exactly happening? Because people can be like, ah, oh, yeah, you're just saying that. But there was some actually details to this. Yeah, so um, on the Business of Fashion uh, article that that we got came across, uh, it's basically saying that Nike has sold out 61% more merchandise since the controversial ad campaign featuring Kaepernick appeared earlier this month, according to data from Thomson Reuters. So, I mean, I think that anybody that supports Kaepernick and Nike kind of probably already assumed this was going to be the case. Like, regardless of political choices, Nike is an incredibly smart business in, you know, first and foremost. And this just kind of goes to show they knew what they were doing. They probably calculated, you know, all of this stuff well in advance to say like, okay, this is, 
this is the amount of people that are going to be pissed. This is the amount of people that are actually going to take action. This is the amount of people that are going to stop buying our stuff. And we're still going to move forward with it because obviously as a marketing campaign, it got a lot of attention from both sides of that whole belief. It, it, you know, it got everyone talking about it, whether you liked it or not. It was easily the most like, you know, the most like shared thing that I've seen in a long time for any of the footwear brands. Um, and, and more so it was just way outside of the normal reach of like, let's say, you know, a sneaker type thing, right? Like, even even like LeBron's uh, school, right? Like that reached like mainstream media, sports, all of that stuff, but it didn't go right. across. And like you know, this was one of those things that you saw on like every type of site across the web. So I think um, you know, I, I just think it was well calculated by Nike, and and kudos to them for. The, I mean, you know, personally, I, I think that it's a good decision to stand behind Kaepernick with as the brand but also just from a marketing standpoint like you have to kind of respect that they knew what they were getting themselves into by doing this quote controversial thing yeah i i i do hearing you say that makes me really think it's i find it fascinating how far and wide this ad was was able to go i don't recall many ads being shared in this sort of way um there's nothing that I can think of, not in recent history, where an ad really, and legitimately, it is an ad at the end of the day. That it's not, it's not like a social statement. It's really an ad for Nike at the end of the day. I don't, and I can't think of anything that in recent history that can measure up, even like the funny stuff, even like Super Bowl ads. Yeah. Like generally, Super Bowl ads are, are shared pretty wide, pretty wide. But I feel like this had a bigger impact even than something like that. I mean, you're excluding auto lacing, right? <laughs> I am excluding okay, auto just lacing. Checking. I am excluding <laughs> auto lacing. Yes, yes. Absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. I, I no, mean, it's I, true. I, I, I don't know when an ad has gone so global, so like controversial, so big. Like, you know, it's what it's what Nike used to do a lot of, you know, but like, I think it's great. I think it's great that they're taking a stand and they got this publicity. The numbers to me are shocking. The news made it sound like way more people were revolting against them or boycotting them versus supporting them. So I was I was surprised to hear that. Hearing Tiffany say that, it's interesting because they did focus, a lot of the news was focused on the negative aspect of the ad and of the campaign and the the revolts are, are the people that were... Um, that were boycotting, quote unquote, boycotting Nike. That really was the story. There wasn't a lot of the story that was like Nike released an ad and it's been embraced by everybody. It, it's interesting because news organizations, they'll draw that line for the positive because they don't want to be seen as continuing to promote the brand. But if it has some sort of negative impact on society, and this is probably something for a totally different conversation, but if it has a negative impact or it's perceived as negative, they they jump all over it, which is really interesting to me. Yeah, most definitely. Yeah. And I think that's kind of a, a common thing in all news too, right? Like that's just like, it's, it's like clickbait. Negative clickbait is going to get people to click and read and, you know, get people to a site to watch some video like right. more often than not. Um, and I, I think the interesting thing, you know, to me is that I, I kind I'm not, I'm not, I'm kind of on the opposite side of the, of the spectrum from Tiffany. Like I'm not surprised by this at all. I actually think like, you know, you see all this negative stuff online. You see it, you know, in the comments of YouTube videos, you see it on Twitter. Like you see negativity right. everywhere. Right. But, like, if you stop and think about, like, on a daily basis, how many bad things, negative things happen to you? It's very minimal compared to the incredible amount of positive things and good experiences or just normal experiences that you have with humans on an everyday basis, right? Like, you, you, right. you probably could go into a Starbucks 50 times in a day and have two or three times out of those 50 be run into somebody that's going to have this, like you know, negativity or, 
you know, racism or any of those things that like pe- that get people triggered, right? And I think like that's to, that to me is like how I think this ad really just goes back to like what what Tiffany was saying. Like Nike's always been about inspiring people to be be better people, and I think that at the end of the day is is what they're trying to say with this ad. And it wasn't just Kaepernick; it was like obviously a handful of their top athletes and a very diverse group of athletes. And I think that that's what people, you know, like a lot of people are just tired of the negativity, right? Like you, you can't, you, you kind of like, you know, I would even bet that people are like using Twitter less than they were, you know, like, even though people are, are taking news stories from Twitter now, which is kind of insane, but like on the flip side of it, like a lot of people are just like, yeah, I don't need to see that. Like, I'm just going to move forward and, and enjoy my life because it's all good. Yeah. It's interesting. It is. It is interesting. And I think it, you know, it just demonstrates like that consumer loyalty. Like, I think it's an, a fascinating study on consumer loyalty, right? Because they say a bunch of people just left Nike, burned their stuff, a bunch of people galvanized. But you can't forget less than a month ago, Nike was in the news for a lot of negative stuff. They've had a negative run of media because of their internal corporate culture. You know, so they right, needed yeah. a win right now. They really needed a win. And so what I I think you have to keep that all in mind, right? Like it's a it's a company. It's not like this one sided face business. It's multi it has a multi facets to it. And as yeah. long as they're doing more good than they are bad, you know, great. Keep going, keep going, you know, keep trying, keep trying to make it better. That's I think the big difference between some of the brands and Nike is Nike always focuses on that Inspire and they try and blow people out of the water with the Inspire, right? Like they really touch those heartstrings. Yeah. Like the duration of that full commercial, like even if you hated Nike and you were completely against Kaepernick, the duration of that commercial and li- if you actually watched it and listened to it with an open mind, there's no way you didn't think at some point like, man, am I, what about my dreams? Like there's no yeah. way you didn't right. get inspired yeah. because yeah. of the duration and because of how they ran it. And like, I, I shame on the news media for not talking about that. You know, like that's what they should have talked about. Like someone should have talked about that. Yeah, pushing you, pushing you to be more. And Nike takes a very, they take a very unique angle with, their, with the way that they inspire you that they want you to be a better version of you yep. is is the is the sales pitch for you to be a better version of you not for you to be better than someone else it's just hey you be the best you like don't don't only be the worst person on the podcast be the worst <laughs> podcaster ever <laughs> like that's that's really like they they encourage you <laughs> to really go go all the way and and push the limits of like how terrible can you really be as a podcaster like if like for instance you know let's just say it was like hey Jacques don't be the worst podcaster like make people not want to listen to podcast ever again like that's <laughs> that like that would have been like my role in this thing in this thing i mean um, this sounds so. negative but it's not just for everyone listening this is not <laughs> negative <laughs> Uh, I mean, so, I, I think so, that yeah. that's kind of, you know, the the thing about that is like businesses in general, like I think that, you know, Tiffany's spot on with like if you're doing more good than than bad, like keep moving forward. And I think that like it's so hard to like understand all the facets of businesses, especially big and successful businesses, because there's a lot of stuff that goes on that like that. I just don't think like people would be comfortable with, you know, and that's why they've chose not to be a part of those businesses. Right. But in general, like, you know, I think all businesses that are very successful provide a value to people beyond the product that they put out or beyond the service that they put out. Right. Like if you think about like, you know, Nike has done that, you know, for 30, 40 years now. Right. But like even like a business like Amazon. Right. Like they they absolutely you know like we've talked about this on a previous episode right like tiffany said something along the lines of like if it's basics then it comes from amazon and i don't have to think about it and that takes that gives you hours a week literally hours a week back into your life just because 
they've figured out a system to get product to you. And like, you know, it's, it, you could argue that they're taking all the money in the world and you could, you know, argue that Jeff Bezos is now donating a bunch of money to, you know, kind of counterbalance that. But I think at the end of the day, like, even if you look at like an Apple or even like probably like automotive manufacturers at some, some level, right? Like the, the big and successful long running manufacturers or businesses of any kind always have like additional value to what they actually are selling as a service or a product in my opinion and i think nike is just really good at spinning that into a public facing way of marketing themselves yeah agreed agreed they're really good at that they're absolutely good at that and let's be honest like society has a very short memory like we'll forget we'll we forgive and forget very very easily with with all things um, you come back and make us feel good about ourselves and, you know, you, you can sit back at the table and have dinner, uh, yeah. which is which is which is more of a reflection of, of our society as a whole. But now uh, I'm no sociology professor. <laughs> uh, anyway, <laughs> you're not. I thought you <laughs> time for, no, right. You, you, you would think you would think. Uh, the way that I talk about sneakers the, uh, <laughs> to make the transition even more awkward. Uh, so Vivo Barefoot is a shoe brand and they do sustainable footwear. Well, now they do. No, in the future, they'll do sustainable footwear. And we've kind of talked about this before with with Reebok, with their corn based shoe and it looks like they're using the same material. It's called Sustera Propandiol. Um, is propanid- Propanidiol is what I'm going to say. Uh, it's called, probably wrong, but Propane I'll go with dial. it. <laughs> Propane dial. Yeah. Is that what it is? Yeah. Propane dial? Yeah, I tried to look it up yeah. and it so- sounds like it's propane dial propane dial okay I, f- I felt like it needed to be more complicated than that yeah we use sustera <laughs> propandial and it's derived from like glucose that. and field corn yes yeah, so that's how I, that's how i figured someone would say it so propane so sustera propane deal dial deal look it's spelled p-r-o-p-a-n-e-d-i-o-l so that's why i can't say it I'm, I, I host a podcast, people. You can't expect that much from me. You can't expect me to know a lot, how to spell words as well or pronounce pronounce words as well. Um, but regardless of my ignorance, the the shoes are based with corn, which I think is very fantastic. And although it's not edible corn, which is something else, and it's not exactly corn, I guess it's corn based, a vegan by biopolymer and um at this point i'm gonna stop talking and let (laughs) tiffany explain to you what that means okay so i did some research on this because it's it it is the same chemical that's coming from dupont tate and lyle which is a merger of two chemical companies and um yeah so they use field corn okay so field corn is normally fed to livestock they use it for some corn starch a few cereals things like that, but it's not like sweet corn that you eat. It's more the corn that's Mm. dried. It's called dented corn. So it's dried out, you know, they harvest at the end of season. So what DuPont, Tate and Lyle do is they ferment it and it goes through this whole process. You can look it up on their website. And once they're done with it, then basically this is the part that no one's really talking about. They give it to like Vivo Barefi or Reebok. Reebok then mixes it with other materials or they have someone that mixes it to make it a resin, right? To turn it into a bioplastic, so a plastic, right? And so normally these plastics would be coming from fossil fuels, right? Natural gas, oil, which are not renewable. So that's a negative, right? But since it's corn, you regrow it every year. But it's great that it's renewable and they're regrowing it. That's awesome. But there's two other parts of the story that they're not talking about, right? So once they make into a plastic resin, then you make it, you mold it, right? Into uh, midsole, outsole, or fibers for the upper. Once that's done, then they build it like a regular shoe. So they're using glues, they're kind of processing it like regular. Well, it's the idea of adding that corn fluid to whatever they're adding it to and then running it through normal footwear processes that make it so it's not it doesn't really matter that it's made out of corn anymore because it's not decomposable, it's not recyclable, and it's not biodegradable. So 
it's important to look at the fact that it's renewable on the front end, the material is, but they also have to look at how are you assembling it and what are you doing to it? Are you transforming it so it's not biodegradable? And then at the end, how does it, what happens at the end of the shoe, right? What happens at the end of life for that shoe? Does it get incinerated? Does it get thrown into a landfill, which is the two most popular things right now? Or does it get recycled? That's like, that's part of the equation. So it's fantastic. It's definitely a step in the right direction that they're using a renewable material, but you can't forget about these other two areas of assembly, what you're adding to it, and then how does it decompose? How does it biodegrade? Like arguably the biodegrading and the, the incinerating of shoes and landfill, that to me seems like a bigger issue than the front. So even, wow. though, even though there's corn in this, it is still gonna get burn up or it's gonna go in a landfill because there's not a way to recycle it right now. Hmm. So I guess just to kind of, I guess to jump in here, because it's made out of corn, when it is incinerated, if it is incinerated, does that have less of an impact on the environment if, in, if it was something else? We don't know because, because they, they basically provide a liquid. This company provides this corn liquid that's then mixed with other materials to make a resin. And it all depends on what the other material is, right? That could be like something that's super toxic and we don't know. Oh, all they talk about is it. that this initial material, and I think Vivo is saying like 60% of their midsole and 30% of their upper is gonna be made of this material. So you have the other 40% of midsole and and 70% of upper that is other materials they're not talking about. So it's all about what's in that material they're not talking about to figure out hmm. if it's better for the environment on the end of life of the product. Hmm. So what what other alternatives exist right now that would actually be, you know, let's say better for that, you know, whatever that percentage is are there things that are that are better like you know on the back end that you know, you know like cr crocs arguably i think are based out of one material so that would mean they're recyclable uh so that they can be ground up and reused um any any material any single material shoe right now like not a lot are good let's just say that not almost it's we're almost at a null right? Because they're all terrible, right? They're all using bad processes and bad materials and not recyclable. Once, like all birds, right? They're using wool and cotton. Same story, renewable materials on the front end, which is awesome. That is definitely part of the equation, but it's almost more important to figure out the assembly part. How do you disassemble the shoe and how do you recycle it? Or how do you recycle it as one single unit? Got it. So you, so for them using the word, so I, really the, Reebok and Vivo in this situation are using the word sustainability as more of just like a buzzword um, than it is yeah. actionable. Because looking at looking at the bottom of the article where it says environmental good, it actually says that Sustera Propandiol uses 42% less energy than the standard petroleum-based materials used by the global footwear industry and 56% less greenhouse gas emissions. So, and who knows what that global footwear industry, where that number comes from. So I'm sure they're using the highest number that they could find. And um, use, it's, it's not about being sustainable at all. It's more just that they're basically, that they're using less of the, and, and emitting less of the bad stuff is what it seems like. Yeah, which are all three, using the renewable material, the corn, and those two factors of using less water and less energy, all great, right? But the, it should be really better sustainability. Like they're making it better, which is awesome. I wouldn't call it good. We're not at the level of being good yet. And yes, sustainability mm. is a catch-all word, just like innovation, like, um, I don't know, you put your dishes in the dishwasher after you use them, like that's innovative if you've never done that before, right? Like innovation is a catch all right. word, just like sustainability right now. Like I used a water bottle, a reusable water bottle once this week, I'm good on sustainability. No, you're, you're better than you were, but you're not at mm -hmm. a good level until you're not using it. Ah, uh, got Does it. Does it make sense? Got it, got it. That's my, yeah, that's yeah. my opinion, that, that just in sense. studying sustainability a bit. 
Yeah. It, no, and that that makes sense. And that go ahead, Nick. I was just gonna say it, it's kind of crazy though. Like, just I mean, I agree with you 100. percent Like, there's so many things that we're not aware of. You know, throughout all of these processes that you know things are made, things are recycled. How you know, and, and I 100 percent agree with the sustainability just being like the catchphrase that people want to throw out there. But I will say that doing this podcast every week, it's been really awesome to be able to see brands at least taking a stab at changing something as opposed yep. to doing nothing. And yep. I, like as, as much as like we're a long way from being in a good place with a lot of this stuff. And, and this is like, you know, obviously well beyond footwear, but like the last probably three years in footwear, there's just been so many people trying new things and, you know, at least to my memory, I don't remember that happening five, ten years ago. It would be like a, a one, one, one-off one thing where somebody would try something unique and you would see it and then it would disappear and back to normal kind of production type stuff. But... Yeah, no, this is this is super positive. Like this is all all great. It's a it's just about more knowledge. Like don't think that this is the end game and all consumers should be pushing brands to be better on the sustainability side. So it's like one piece of the equation is getting started to be figured out. And they both talked about using a material that is uh, biodegradable at some point so that this sterile might be biodegradable, but it all depends on what they mix it with. So that's on their radar, which is huge. Yeah, I know that was a big thing for for Reebok. They were they they admitted that this version of the shoe, the corn shoe, is what I'm going to call it. Yeah, that it, it wasn't biodegradable, but something that they were aiming towards was making the next version of the shoe biodegradable. Basically, they were saying like you would be able to have that shoe, put it in, you know, be finished with it, wear it out or whatever, and you could bury it in the backyard, and that it would eventually biodegrade back into the earth. And I, I think that would put it at a point where sustainability is has fully been achieved. Is would that be accurate? Um, close, because at that point, you know, most of the municipalities that run the recycling program stuff, like something has to biodegrade within eight months. Some are less, some are more. If it doesn't within that time, then it still goes in the incinerator. Or it still goes in the landfill. So we got to work with them too to like if it if it takes nine months, like. Let's make space for this because it's a start, right? So, again, oh, it's a first okay. step, but there's a few other organizations we got to get involved to try and help, also. Oh, so there are there are organizations that kind of set the rules on sustainability as far as like if it biodegrades in this amount of time, that 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 gives it an A rating, so to speak. Versus if it does it in nine months, then that's a B ratings. Is that kind of how it um, how that works? Not so much on the ratings, but they just can't hold stuff that's supposed to biodegrade for for long, right? They run out of space, physical space. So they have to limit it if that if it hasn't biodegraded in X amount of time, then they have to just get rid of it. Um, right. I don't know exactly the bodies. I'm guessing like, you know, waste management company of Oregon or whatever. Uh, are the ones yeah, regulating yeah, yeah. that, but we can definitely look up more and kind of help educate on that. Yeah, I'd love to look. I'd love to look into that more. This is app, this is just fascinating to me, just because you know, as a as a person that lives on this planet, you know, you obviously want to make sure that you do whatever you can to make things sustainable or things recyclable and don't use up all the planet's natural resources. So stuff like that is just stuff like this really just is really fascinating to me, and, and seeing seeing the opportunities there and brands really reacting to that. Um, I think that's a good thing. I think it, think it definitely it helps everybody. It makes everything better. It makes it better for everyone. Anyway, with that being said, let's do another awkward transition that has absolutely nothing to do with that, although we're still talking about shoes, so I guess that works. So the question came up for, for this topic was, does, should, I should say, not does, should your team wear the same shoes that you wear. So uh, I'll put this <laughs> in a way. I don't want to point fingers at anyone, but say I have a deal with the Tiffany Beers sneaker brand. Yes. And um, lucky guy. I have, lucky guy. Yes. Lucky guy. I, I was the first. Um, I, I like to, <laughs> just throwing that out there. And, but my, say my photographer or say my manager. Or whoever that works with me, my my right hand ace, my business manager that's with me everywhere that I go, he wears 
Nick Ingvall's Skate Shoes yes. of America oh. brand. <laughs> so, should if I'm more popular, if I am the lead, if I'm leading this train, if if if, if my intellectual property is what brings in the revenue for this team should everyone on my team be wearing the tb2 or is it okay that my business manager wears the ne3 how like i'm I'm gonna toss this one to you nick because i feel like you can uh you could jump in here and give us some insight uh i mean the, the ne3 is where it's at um but what no. Jacques, are you trying to talk us into wearing the same shoes as you on the podcast like what's happening here i'm just i'm just, I'm just asking questions here i'm just asking questions no i i think that it's i think that you know there's a lot of this back and forth between um you know creators and entertainers and you know the the whole like idea that everyone that rolls with somebody you know let's say like drake being a part of jordan brand should everybody wear jordans in his crew you know i i just i don't think that's possible at this point and i think that you know there's so much crossover with the way people like you know work together and you know like the let's build fams of the world like those types of people that are out there creating and and doing things like you want to be around them. So, you know, like if, in in my opinion, if, you know, if Tiffany's making a dope shoe, then you should support Tiffany making a dope shoe. And if Jacques has, you know, the JS one finally coming out after all these years, then you should support Jacques shoe too, but you should also wear my shoe. Like, I just think that like, there shouldn't be this like brand wars kind of thing. I get that it's trendy to, you know, like, checks over stripes and nike versus adidas and all of those things and Jumpman over yeezy and all that stuff but at the end of the day like we see, like the the realest people are the most like likely to be seen wearing everything right like people that are passionate about let's say footwear that would go get a deal with nike or jordan or adidas they probably have a closet full of shoes from a variety of different manufacturers and brands and you know and like just because a travis scott you know wears his own jordan doesn't necessarily mean that like he's not gonna wear you know a yeezy because he's got a song with yeezy or whoever it is you know what whoever they're collaborating with but i i don't know i mean i i think that like the expectation that you should be like limited to one brand based on the people you hang out with is kind of just a little too much. I mean, I, I think you should just, I think it's cool to see people supporting whatever they're doing. Now, if you're, you know, the level of like LeBron James, where you're literally the most important athlete on the Nike, you know, roster, obviously you would never want to be wearing Yeezys. Is your kid going to wear Yeezys? Yeah, we've already seen that. Like, that's kind of just expected at this point, right? Like, you want your kid to have those experiences. You want them to be excited about new music from Kanye or new music from Travis or, you know, like, all those people that are out there doing things and inspiring, they should get the opportunity to, like, support whoever it is, in my opinion. I just think if if there's a business interest somewhere, then your team should be representing that business interest because that business interest is helping to pay their bills that's my thought uh if we're just if we're just homies then whatever but if there's a business connection i think you should be representing as well well maybe that's just me i disagree respectfully i think uh like puma wnba business you're gonna make them all wear pumas no. Well, not. I mean, if they have a deal, no. If they have a deal, obviously, then no. Like, if you have a deal with someone else, then that makes sense. But if you don't, you should probably be wearing Pumas. No way. The difference in shoes and the last differences and the narrowness and the width and, their, and the toe box height, all those things come into a major factor in being comfortable and being able to be used. I think... If you're if you're doing an event that's not performance based, absolutely everybody 
support your business, like support the brand that you're with. But like if you're doing physical activity that you're performing at, you should wear what's com- what works for you and what's comfortable for you. You know, like I, I think there's two sides to that coin. Um, although, you know, I played on sports teams where we had to wear Reebok and I didn't. You know, I just dealt with it and did not wear it because it did not fit me well at the time. You know, like, you just like, okay, I'm going to play worse if I wear this product. I think that has to be taken into consideration big time. And when Nike shoes are typically pretty narrow and uh, Adi's wide, but not the widest, right? There's there's wider brands than Adi even. Um, I think we have to take that into consideration too, especially, you know, if you're... If you're a six foot five athlete, um, your feet are totally different than someone like me who's, you know, five four, hundred pounds. <laughs> Just kidding. Right. Yeah. Yeah. No, that makes sense. That makes sense. I don't know. I guess. I guess I was thinking. I wasn't thinking of the performance aspect, but I guess it, as a as a when you you should definitely wear what's comfortable for you if you are an athlete or if there is performance attached to your footwear. Yeah. But if you know, if Nick and I are walking into a meeting and Nick is my business manager and I'm going to a meeting with Nike, Nick should probably have on Nikes. Yeah, I, I mean, yeah, no. You probably like, should. Shame on you, Nick. <laughs> Sorry, I messed this all up. Um, no, and, and to be clear, like, I mean, like, I don't think that you should should not consider what you're doing in that day, you know, based on who you're around and who you're working with, right? Like, I mean, I... I the only justification for having the hundreds of shoes or more that I have is that a lot of those shoes opened conversations with people from brands that I would have never thought to, to work with because I was just curious about what was all out there. You know, like I own shoes from probably 30 or 40 different brands and m- maybe even more than that at this point. And the reason that I did that is because, you know, for me, like I wanted to be like, a respected voice in the community of sneakers and in order to justify me being a voice that people would listen to in my mind i kind of was like look if i'm going to tell you that you know the jordan 3 is the best shoe of all time or the reebok question is the best shoe of all time or whatever that is then i want you to know that i've already experienced all of these other shoes to get to this point and that was why i that was why like my collection went from like fairly focused to like let me just consume as much as i can in like a a way that like and and it's been great like it's it's created opportunities for me like i've met people that worked with brands and then moved to other brands and like i've been able to work with them throughout different things because i just have a passion for footwear in general but like i i think that like if you're ever going to have the if you want to have the opportunity to work in the sneaker business no matter what like i don't care if you saw that somebody said it was corny on the internet wear the brand that you're going to do business with and if that means going to one meeting at a trade show at 9 a.m and then going into the bathroom and changing into the other shoes for the next meeting do that all day long because that shows that you're actually respectful of that company's history and work that they've put in like you at least went out and purchased a shoe or acquired a shoe you don't even have to buy it borrow one from a friend but like that's a huge huge you know like i i think that's probably like one of the biggest mistakes that people make trying to work in in the sneaker business right like a lot of these brands might not seem like they're competitive on the the face but like behind the scenes they just want to know that like hey you're willing to respect me enough to wear our product to meetings with us and that to me is right. a completely different thing than you know like let's say you know let, let let's take Kylie Jenner right she has a deal with Adidas now she is you know had a kid with Travis Scott who is you know obviously a Jordan guy like she was with Puma like there's there, like there's a lot of like gray area for those celebrities because they're always going to be out and about with each other and they all have their own things but I would argue that collectively like as a group it's also really important for them to just be like the cool face of whatever's going on so if let's say you know somebody can get a pair of shoes early and and all of a sudden their you know Instagram account jumps 
20 or 30,000 followers because all the sneaker blogs pick up that they wore, you know, the Jordan, you know, 33 early or something like that to me is like a, a more strategic long-term play than wearing the same shoes that your partner has, you know, because they have their pair on that day or whatever. And I, I think it's a really gray area, but I think that, you know, I agree with Tiffany, like from a performance standpoint, like you absolutely have to wear what you feel good in and, and not just like the, like, kind of like, I feel good when I put on the freshest shoes, like it has to work for you. And that to me is like a huge distinguishing point in, in like my conversation with this. But I don't know. I, I think we're just at a point where everybody's doing so much. And like you said earlier, Jacques, everybody forgets so quickly that m- most people are never going to realize that like, you know, somebody was wearing something that they shouldn't have, you know, like, I mean, even think of like Drake right now, like, you know, he's back with Jordan brand or whatever. And, but he had like, a couple of months of wearing Yeezys and that to me is really weird. Like even weirder knowing that he's going to create, you know, more Jordans, but I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. No, I get it. I get it. It makes, it makes sense. And, um, speaking of Jordan, actually, before I even change, change subjects, what do you guys think? Let us know, um, what you think. Hit us up at outside pods, letting us know what you think. Should your team wear? And by team, I mean like the people that you hang with, should they wear the same shoes that you wear if you have a deal with a brand and you are maybe let's, let's, say, let's just say you're the primary breadwinner of the crew and should the rest of the team wear the same shoes that you wear let us know what you think hit us up at outside pods but speaking of jordan uh some uh, we're going to call this the rumor section so um we don't really have a, a, a an intro for this segment so we're going to kind of do this one off the cuff uh, this is the rumor section. <laughs> um, so none of this has been confirmed quite yet, although there was one post by Frank Cooker. Um, but Jordan is doing more React shoes. And when uh, I first brought this topic to Tiff and Nick, I, I was acting totally brand new. Like I didn't know that uh, Jordan had done React before. But Tiffany kindly reminded me that Jordan has already been on the React train, so this isn't anything new. So for those that were like me and acting brand new, just know that this stuff already happened back in, gosh, that was it last summer? Was it last summer, Tiffany, or two summers ago? Yeah, I don't know when the Jordan shoe came out, but if you look at Nike.com, there's a Jordan React shoe, the Superfly, I think, right now. You can can buy it right now. So the Superfly React came out for basketball, and I believe that was last summer um, when, uh, with, with Blake Griffin before he left the Clippers and made America sad. But <laughs> they're doing React shoes now that are, I don't, I, I guess these are lifestyle shoes. And this is something that Jordan always, I feel like, struggles with, is with creating lifestyle silhouettes. And there's a, supposed to be a Air Jordan Apex React, an Air Jordan Apex Utility, an Air Jordan Proto React, and an Air Jordan React Low. I'm sorry, and a Jordan React Assassin. So there's one, two, three, four, five different React-based shoes that, are, that will be coming out on Jordan brand, according to uh, the rumor mills and the rumor sites i don't know if any of this is true this is according to pi rates on twitter um but it's an interesting idea for me because i always i always see jordan brand sort of embracing technology from nike and I, i really want them to create something on their own is guess what i'm really trying to say yeah and i'll leave that at that um, I mean, wh- I mean so, what do you mean you want them to create something on their own? I mean, you know they sit right beside everyone at Nike. It's all it's all one big family. Yeah, so I, I don't know. I just feel like, well, maybe it's, it's it seems like Nike takes over all of, takes the cool stuff, and then Jordan integrates it into their thing. I guess I, I, I still see them as two separate entities, although they are obviously one huge company. But it, 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 it like, I don't see... 
Jordan creating Zoom X, or I don't see Jordan creating React. It seems like that's something that Nike does, and then Jordan gets on board with it. Yeah, it's pretty safe to say anything that's cushioning based, like primarily cushioning based, you know, it, it gets developed in running first, right? Because running, cushioning and running is just, you know, more of a critical factor, I would say. But look at Flight Plate. Flight Plate was Jordan. It didn't go anywhere else. Um, Nike never right. used the Flight Plate. And that was a plated technology for stability in basketball. Jordan created that. So um, I think you just have to, like, understand that in basketball the the elements that are necessary i think brand jordan does a great job of coming up with stuff on their own but it's never something you're going to see across like tons and tons and tons of shoes right like jordan doesn't really have running Mm -hmm. shoes they kind of have running shoes but not really their lifestyle you know is like retro so that doesn't really count so you know it's it's not like they're going to put flight plate on a lifestyle shoe either because it's a performance most of the time carbon fiber plate and it's expensive so um, i think jordan does a pretty good job of developing technology if they had a bigger running core of product you'd probably see more cushioning technologies come out of them Um, like foams like the foams you know but just throwing react in a basketball shoe you'll notice that so far it hasn't been just solely react in the basketball shoe there's always been a um, carrier if you will so an external piece of a, a stiffer foam or a harder foam that carries the React because that React has a bad split tear and it has a bad, you know, it's just not stable, kind of like Boost. Like Boost isn't really stable. There isn't really an all Boost basketball shoe, right? It has, I'm not super familiar with the Boost basketball shoes, but they all need more support. Um, So if, if you keep that in mind, like I think we could probably pull out a handful of technologies that Jordan's done a good job of launching and not shared with Nike, which is surprising to me. Yeah, I, I guess I, I guess I, I would look forward to. I feel like everything that Nike does transitions into a lifestyle element, and the stuff that Jordan does doesn't necessarily do that. Right. So, but and but, but maybe that's a cost thing. Maybe flight maybe flight plate isn't just something that can transition to lifestyle easily, as opposed to React, which technically is a running shoe. But I feel like the Epic React is is more it seems like a lifestyle shoe, even though you can run in the Epic React. I guess that's more of more of the angle that that I was approaching, but maybe that's what this is: the Air Jordan Apex. Maybe they're this is their their foray into the into the lifestyle version uh, of Jordan shoes. And from what I can tell, there are some the interesting designs, especially this one by Frank Cooker. It's a very interesting take, but it's all based, uh, but it's based kind of based in heritage a little as well. So it'll be interesting to see how it all how it all comes together or maybe this is an early version of the air jordan 33 and we don't even know it but you know just putting that out there that that would be very interesting (laughs) um but speaking of running there was an incredible incredible feat but before i get to get to that i almost almost forgot our sponsor got to pay for this show somehow uh so outside the box is brought to you by <laughs> light switchers light switchers is an app for your phone that helps you turn on and turn off lights they like to call themselves the uber of the environment or the uber of electricity <laughs> so how it works is say say you're sitting down watching tv and you personally don't want to turn off the light. What you do is you use the app on your phone. It calls someone to your house and they turn off the light for you. It's a fantastic idea. I, I absolutely love it. We're, we're very, we're, we're, we're all, all the way behind the light switcher. So go ahead to your iOS or Google Play Store and download the light switchers app. Uh, never turn off a light again. That's their slogan. Um, so... Just putting it out there for you guys. Uh, now, getting back to running, there was an incredible, incredible feat. Oh, sorry, just to go back. Uh, never turn on or off a light again. Light switchers. Uh, sorry. So, the on the running side of things, <laughs> there was a, an incredible feat that happened over, uh, over the weekend. The marathon record was broken by uh and I, I i don't know if i always say his name right i always say uliad kipchoge uh is that the proper way to say it tiff i think it's Ulid kipchoge kipchoge okay kipchoge i call him kipchoge we're close um kipchoge <laughs> and he broke the marathon record by a minute 
So the record for the marathon is now two hours, one minute, and 39 seconds. And just to give you guys an idea of how incredible that is, let's say there's someone in peak physical condition, uh, trained for weeks and weeks on end, changed his diet, lost 10 maybe 15 pounds and uh his marathon time was three hours and 45 minutes and 33 seconds so not put just you know not to compare a world-class athlete with another world-class athlete but i'm saying that my time was almost two hours slower than kipchoge's and i felt like i was running my tail off so Tiffany did the math earlier, and you said he was going how how fast per hour? Well, if you just run the numbers, right, a marathon is 26.2 miles. So if he does it in two hours, he's running 13.1 miles per hour. M- Do you know how that fast that is? That is insane. Insane. Goodness <laughs> gracious. So I was almost four hours. So that puts me at like half of his speed, basically. I'm pretty pretty much half of his speed. If if we do do the right, and that that just makes me feel great, especially as hard as I worked to uh, get <laughs> get to that point. Um, yeah. But I, I, you know, honestly, I think we we are at an incredible time with running, um, and we're seeing athletes that are really pushing the limit and doing things that no one expected. Obviously, the two hour barrier is the big big barrier, and Kipchoge got close to that with the Nike breaking two, where he it was two hours and I think twenty four seconds. Twenty five, yeah. So he twenty five seconds. Yeah. So he was basically what a minute. Um, a little more than a minute off of that time, which is just mind blowing. So I, I think I, I feel like we'll see the two hour barrier be broken, you know, in the next maybe let's say five to ten years. Just because I think athletes are getting better, they're getting faster. Science is getting better and teaching us how to fine tune our bodies, how to run. How, what's most efficient for us, what what our bodies react to when we eat certain things and putting us in a, in a physical conditions where I think that two hour barrier is going to come tumbling down. And I think it's going to be incredible. And hopefully I'll be a part of that in some way because um, I would love to be there to see something like that. Um, yeah, I kind of took over this whole conversation just because, you know, I ran a marathon, just putting that out there. Um, but Tiffany, you just ran a half, right? Yeah, I walked a half and ran a little bit. I, uh, I'm doing a lot of walking these days and man, it kicked my butt and it, and my time was three hours and 13 minutes, right? So 13.1 miles and three hours and 13 minutes. I can't even fathom running 26.2 miles at a pace of four minutes and 38 seconds per mile for every single month. Like this guy has to be close to like a superhero, a real life superhero. I mean, who who can do that, right? Like who can do that? It's so phenomenal, it's amazing. The big question I have is what shoes was he wearing, right? He was wearing the 4% originally. It looked like he was wearing a different shoe to me. I can't tell. Um, at this point, oh. but like, I want to know how much impact did those shoes make? Like the, the person that was second behind him was like four minutes later, I think. What shoes were they oh, wearing? Gosh. You know, like, I mean, four minutes to the regular wow. Joe seems like nothing, but in that grand scheme of things, if you divide it by 26.2 miles, how much faster you had to run every mile is insane. Insane. That's insane. Like for for people that, that 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 I don't know that don't necessarily understand how fast thirteen miles per hour is, um, they won't even let you run that fast on a treadmill. Uh, I think most treadmills top out at ten miles per hour. Yep. So just to give you an idea of exactly how fast he was going, like I've I've gone to the gym and I've pushed it to ten, like from like my last lap. Mind you, that's just one lap, mind you, and I'm dead 
afterwards. Like it's I'm like they've it's crushed me. So I know I I can can testify that 13 miles an hour is an incredible incredible pace, and to keep that up for two hours straight is just really pushing yourself and really being a, a completely fine tuned athlete. I love it. I'm amazed by it. You know, kudos to him. It's inspiring for me to make, you know, my goal is to break three hours at some point. So I've got 45 minutes to shave off of my time. Ooh. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah, it's Ooh. it's yeah, so I insane, know. too. Like, I was actually just looking up on, on, like, the Strava app. Like, my last, like, bike ride, like, I, I like, average around 13 miles an hour on my bike. And that feels like, <laughs> like... I mean, I obviously, like, you know, peak at, like, 20-something when I'm, like, getting on it. And then, like, you know, depending on where I'm riding, I've got to slow down and stuff. But, like, I'm usually between, like, 13 and 15 miles an hour on my rides. And that's insane to think that, like, somebody would be, like, running at that pace. Because, like, the people that, like, let's say if I'm, you know, like, riding on the beach here, like, there's nobody that's like anywhere close to the same speed as me on my bike that's running like and to think that he's right averaging that at like for a full two hours like i don't even know if i could do that on my bike i mean uh, that's insane <laughs> and he doesn't yeah, look like incredible. he's working you know he just looks yeah like just he's like not a stroll, out for a stroll man. Yeah. <laughs> like he's out for yeah. a run i'm like you know yeah. i'd be like you know the bunny in um sylvester and no wait that's the wrong cartoon i'd be like a cartoon character out there like woofing it <laughs> be yeah, terrible. yeah he he his 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 face looks like he's just have like he's just like oh yeah yeah just gonna, gonna go out for a run today you know trying to stay in shape you know keep, keep the body right <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> watching my figure and he's like yeah, yeah, just watching my figure. You know, I want to be able to eat a donut later today, so I'm gonna go run. Like he's out there crushing it with that with that sort of face on. What? So uh, big props to him, and uh, I, I really I really appreciate the the work that he does and like how dedicated he is to his training and and dedicated how as dedicated as he is to pushing himself to to being um, a better a better athlete. Um, it's inspiring. Uh, with that being said, guys, uh, that's the end of the show today. It was a good show. Uh, I am Jock Slade. As always, you can find us at Outside Pods. Um, again, I'm here to to level the playing field. There are two really super smart, incredibly intelligent people on this show, and it would be too much to have three super intelligent, crazy, <laughs> smart people on this show. So. They brought me in to level it out. It's like it's like the balance of justice. Uh, like I'm here. Like in every movie you watch, there has to be a bad guy. That's who I am. <laughs> but the good guys, they saved this show, and those good guys are Nick and Tiffany. So Nick, tell them where they can find you. Uh, you can find me at Nick Engvall on all platforms N-I-C-K-E-N-G-V-A-L-L and at Sneaker History on all platforms sneakerhistory.com but really I'm just here to you know get in trouble with Jacques and learn from Tiffany so Tiffany let them know how they can find you uh, you can find me on Instagram and YouTube at Tiffany Beers, T-I-F-F-A-N-Y-B-E-E-R-S. And I can't stop thinking about, one, do the light switchers need help? Like, how do you become a light switcher? Um, <laughs> is this, like, a profitable industry? Is this, like, a new thing? Um, and I'm guessing since he ran the marathon in two hours and it was 26.2 miles, he burned 2,600 calories in two hours. I mean, that's amazing. That's almost a pound. Oh. Right? Oh my goodness. See, so you're definitely not, I'm not you're I'm definitely not, not gonna burn that many calories switching lights, but <laughs> shoot. You don't know that. <laughs> you don't know that. You don't know that. It's a running based in, in, job? Is that what you're saying? In, until you become a light switcher, I, I think you shouldn't judge me. <laughs> uh, they have a lot of venture capital money, so you better be careful. <laughs> Uh, there's a lot of a lot of people's lives dependent on light switchers. Uh, again, this show is brought to you by Light Switchers. I'm Jacques Slade. Uh, you can find me at Custo all over the internet, and that's Instagram, Twitter, or YouTube. But more importantly, check us out at Outside Pods on Twitter and Instagram, and leave us some feedback and talk to us. We appreciate you guys. Thank you for listening, and we'll see and or talk to you guys next week. Peace. <laughs>